Now, I've dropped a lot of videos on my channel about Monk Bow, but recently I've been challenged to go more in depth with my videos. And then that made me think to myself like, okay, Glass, you really haven't gone deep. Wait, pause. Uh, nigga, you gay. Like I really haven't gone deep. Like I haven't really shown or shared my process that allows me to get crazy results literally every time I do monk mode. So with that being said, welcome to the complete guide to monk mode. Whether you're new or whether you've been dabbling with monk mode for a while, this video is going to be perfect for you because I'm gonna walk you through everything that you need to know about having a successful monk mode and actually walking away from this experience with some real tangible, real life results. And just on a side note, like God damn, when I was making this video, all I kept thinking to myself was like, damn, I really wish I had a video like this when I started. It would have sure saved me a lot of time and would have stopped me from making a lot of mistakes. So in this masterclass, I'm going to be covering everything from reflecting before you do your monk mode, how to build positive habits, and then how to reflect and analyze your results so that you're constantly improving in rapid fashion. So with all that being said. Let's get started with the masterclass. Oh, a couple more things. This first video is one you guys have already probably seen, but I do think it's still important for you to watch it because it details the importance on why you should go monk mode now more than ever. And it just kind of gives you a quick overview of everything that we'll be talking about in the course. But of course, if you feel like you if you feel like you already understand all that stuff, then feel free to skip ahead. You can definitely do that. And one more thing, there's going to be a link in the description. It's going to be detailing. It's going to be giving you guys a worksheet to where you can participate and follow along with my exact monk mode process. So if you feel inclined to do that, check it out. Link in the description. OK, now let's start the video. What if I told you? that you're running out of time to create the life you want. Now, trust me, guys, I'm the last person to go around spreading fear, but I'm doing this to make sure that all men know that this is the time to start acting with urgency. And here's why. They say that in the next two to three years, we're going to experience one of the biggest recessions in recent history. And my belief is that a lot of men aren't prepared. And if you don't believe me, just look back to the last recession. Jobs were lost, savings were destroyed. It became a lot harder to make money and average no longer cut. In short, only the strong survive. So it's important to make sure that you are going to be prepared for what's coming. What I'm trying to get through to your head is that it is time to stop playing games and it is time to start focusing on your own personal growth and development. That's gonna be the best defense for the upcoming recession. And the best and fastest way I know how to do that is something called monk mode. What the hell is even that? Monk mode is something I like to call total immersion. It is activating beast mode. It is a period of time where you go all out and you focus on discipline, productivity, personal, professional, and spiritual growth. It's a tool that many successful people have used to level up. Just look at Jorge Masvidal. This is what he used to become one of the UFC's biggest stars. Look at LeBron James. He uses something similar when he goes zero dark 30 for his playoff run. And for me personally, I've used it several times in my life to go from unrecruited bum to four-star college athlete, to go from bottom feeder sales rep to the top sales rep in a company. So trust me when I say I speak from personal experience when I say that monk mode is your hyperbolic time change. And if you do it and you implement it correctly, I guarantee that in 90 days when you look back, you will not be able to recognize yourself in 2023. Now enough of the bullshit. Let's talk about the benefits you get on monk mode. Now firstly, you're going to gain clarity and the great Zig Ziglar said it best. You cannot hit a target that you cannot see and you cannot see a target that you do not have. In other words, without clarity, without a goal, you're dead in the water, bro. Next, you're going to gain focus. In a world where men have the attention span of a gnat, you're going to set yourself apart from all of them. After that, you're going to gain discipline and consistency. Trust me, the average man does his New Year's resolutions for less than a week. You will destroy these men when you're going face to face with them. Next, you're going to build better habits. And most people don't know this, but everything that you do is habit forming. Whether that's sitting on the couch, eating potato chips or reading books, your habits are very powerful and they can work with you or they can work against you. you choose. The next thing that you're gonna get is rapid skill acquisition. In this upcoming recession, the market is going to get very competitive. Those that are building skills are gonna stand head and shoulders above the rest on top of the mountain. You're also gonna be able to increase your output. Like I said earlier in the video, average will no longer cut it. On monk mode, you're going to be able to do more than most men. Therefore, you're going to have more than most men. Lastly, you're gonna develop better spiritual, physical, and mental health. You guys don't get it. When a man is focused, when he cuts out all the bullshit when he is steadily marching towards his goal like a savage that's when he's the most at peace now finally now that all that shit is out the way here's how to do monk mode firstly you're gonna need to gain clarity and i switched this up from my last video because i understand guys i get it it can be hard to choose a goal so i have switched it up and i have decided that you need to go ahead and
didn't do an anti-vision. Shout out to Dan Coe. And anti-vision is really simple. It's all the things that you do not want in life. And sometimes the best way to figure out what you actually want in life is by reliving the things that you did not like. By doing that, by reliving those past memories and remembering what you don't want, you're going to get a lot closer to what you actually do want. Now, once you've clarified your direction, we need to actually get to the destination. We need to be able to see the coordinates, aka choosing your goals. Studies show that people that write down their goals every day are 42 percent more likely to achieve their goal. Now, if that doesn't spark something in you, then I don't know how to help you. Now, after gaining clarity, it is time to fully commit to your goals. That means burning any other bridge besides your goal. You have to do whatever it takes to reach that target. That is because commitment, when you commit, when you say, I'm going here, that is what drives purpose. And once you have purpose, that is when the creativity flows. And when creativity flows, that is what helps you get closer to your goals. In other words, creativity doesn't come till after commitment, not the other way around. And now, now that you've committed, it's time to get everything the hell out the way. Let's start with the rules of monk mode. No drugs, no alcohol, no junk food, no porn, no sex. Let me say that again. No sex, no overconsumption. Guys, in 2023, this is the year that we stop overconsuming and we start creating because I believe a man is truly at his best when he is creating or he is following his purpose. But slow down, cowboy. Don't don't run off just yet. Don't go taking a bunch of action just yet, because there is one important step that you must do first. And if you're truly and I mean truly going to get the best results from monk mode, you need to understand that one of the biggest mistakes people make is not reflecting before they start their self-improvement journey. Do not be the reason that your self-improvement journey was a waste of time. Here's the thing. It is truly impossible to improve yourself in the most efficient way possible if you don't know where you're starting from, if you don't know who you are. So that's why in today's video, I'm going to be talking about the importance of reflecting before you start your self-improvement journey, as well as I'm going to dive into exactly how I do self-reflection, how I look at my life, how I analyze my current situation so that I can then chart a course to where I want to go. Now, y'all know I ain't Elder Scrolls. This ain't Skyrim. We ain't playing no game, so we gonna hop right into it. Look guys, self-improvement is a journey of self-discovery. It's you learning who you are, it's you becoming better, but it really doesn't help if you don't understand where you started from, if you don't take time to actually reflect and see what your current situation looks like. When you take the time to reflect, you gain insight on a lot of good things. You gain insight on your strengths and your weaknesses. You gain insight on mistakes that maybe you've made in the past. And being able to identify your strengths and weaknesses can help you tailor a plan to either use those or systematically improve them to help you get closer to your goal. And not only that, guys, reflecting on your past, reflecting on your current situation, assessing what went wrong, what didn't go right, guys, it empowers you. It empowers you to be able to understand you can make decisions to go to a different place in life if you want. It also empowers you to start your self-improvement journey with confidence because a lot of guys will start a self-improvement journey and they don't even know what they're trying to improve. They haven't even made a target. They don't even have a direction or an aim of where they want to go. So they're just improving willy-nilly and that shit's not going to be effective. I'm sorry to tell you. I mean, seriously, have you ever felt stuck on your self-improvement journey, bro? Like you're like, damn, I'm doing all this. I'm reading all the books. I'm doing all this shit, but nothing's happening happening. I'm not getting any results. That could be because you're working on the wrong things. That could be because you're focused in the wrong place. You're going the wrong direction, guys. Like when you reflect, guys, I don't think you get it. Self-improvement is a journey that requires introspection. That requires you to look inside. You want to understand your goals? Understand yourself first. <laughs> How can you understand a goal, a destination, if you don't even understand you? You at the current time. Guys, self-reflection self is very important. And the number one mistake I see guys doing is hopping headfirst into this self-improvement thing and they don't even know them damn selves. They don't even know where they wanna go and they don't wanna take the time to figure it out. All that is going to lead to is a bunch of wasted energy and effort and motion in the wrong direction. That's why in a few seconds here, we're going to hop into my exact process on how I reflect on my life and how that helps me craft my goals. Now, guys, I want you to look at starting your self-improvement journey like plotting in directions to a GPS. Yeah, I said it, a GPS. There is no possible way to understand how to get to the destination if the GPS does not have your starting location. You ever tried that? When you don't have Wi-Fi or your location ain't on? Try to put in Uber? Try to put in Apple Maps? 
it can't find your ass. So there's no way it can help you get to your destination. That's the point I'm trying to get at, guys. You have to have you have to have a starting point before you can start your self improvement journey. And a lot of niggas skip this step. Finding that starting destination is going to make it a lot easier for you to make a custom plan and tailor what you're doing to help you get to your actual destination. So guys, the first thing that I do when I am self reflecting is I grab myself, I grab myself a journal, bro. I get a journal. Cause I'm going to need this. Cause we going to do a lot of thinking and we going to do a lot of writing. And so one of the ways I definitely use prompts to help me think I'm not a guy that could just, you know, just think on a whim. I need a prompt. I need a question to be asked to me. But one of the things I mentioned in one of my previous videos was an anti-vision. So I will take some time to reflect on my past experiences. I'll get in this journal and I'll start writing. Okay. This girl played me. How did I feel about that? Why did I feel that way? Did I feel disrespected? What could I have done differently to make sure this didn't happen? Okay, I didn't hit my sales quota this quarter. Why is that? What happened? Why am I lacking in my sales profession? What am I missing? What am I not doing? How can I do it better, guys? And I'm just journaling all this stuff. I'm just writing this stuff down. It's helping me create an idea of what I have seen so far and helps me understand and become aware of how I have acted and reacted to these situations. And then it helps me understand how I can be better in those situations. That's how you make continuous progress. The next thing I'll do is use some prompts from like a SWOT analysis. It's basically a, a, a thing that helps you determine your strengths and weaknesses. This is going to be your compass. This is going to help you help shape your self-improvement plan for the direction you want to go or the direction you want to improve. Guys, if you don't understand your strengths and more importantly, if you don't understand your weaknesses, where you fall short, how are you ever going to improve to get where you want? It's going to make it a lot harder. That's why I take time to literally figure out. And, and this stuff changes for me from quarter to quarter, but it helps me to figure out, God, Glasgow, where were you weak? For YouTube, I was weak in thumbnails. I was good at editing. I understood that. That's my strength. I was weak in thumbnails. I was weak in speaking in the camera. I'm kind of an introvert in real life. But guys, I understood that. So I took steps to progressively get better at those things. I hired someone to do my thumbnails. Guys, this all came from me understanding my weaknesses. When you understand your strengths, you can attack those. You can use those to help you get better. When you understand your weaknesses, you can systematically improve them. And that is going to improve your life. Moving on. Next thing I do in my self-reflection process is I define my North Star, like my vision, my big dream achieved. Guys, do not get this confused with a goal. This is not a goal. This is your vision. I'm a guy. I'm a big believer in that. Any like setting five year and 10 year goals is freaking stupid. It's too far away. It's not it's not even effective to set a goal. But I do like to set a vision an overall direction of where I want my life to go. And one of the things I do, guys, I take this journal. And guys, I recommend that you do this for a couple different reasons. A, because visualization and thinking about these things is great for the brain. It helps you get to your goals. But also, guys, just having an idea of exactly what you want helps your brain figure out solutions to get there. So what I'll do is I'll take this journal and I will literally write pages in this journal of what it would look like if I one day woke up and my dream or my goal, my vision was actually fulfilled, it actually happened. I literally go in exact detail. I wake up, there's sun shining on me. I like the sun in my face. You know, it gives me energy in the morning to get up. So in my little journal, I wrote this down. The sun is shining on my face. I got a bad girl. I got a baddie coming out, bringing me coffee. I don't really like coffee, but I like the way she going to look in that gown or that, that, that robe when she bring that coffee. You see, it's like, like I've written all this stuff down. I've written like when I get up, I go to work. I, I, I'm in charge of a bunch of people. We're building meaningful products that are actually helping people's lives. I have written all this stuff down. I have completely visualized and created a scenario of me actually being in a in a world, in a life where I have achieved my dream. And this does a couple things for you. It prepares your mind for this to actually happen. The mind it really can't differentiate between what's real and what's fake. And so I write this thing down and sometimes I come back to it and read it just to get my mind back to that place. This is where we're going. This is what's waiting for us. Help me get there. So, guys, I know it seems extreme, 
But if you really want to take your reflection to the next level after that, start defining your vision, start journaling, start writing down exactly what a day looks like in a life where you have become the man you want to be. Guarantee you it'll help you get to your dreams a lot faster. And now, guys, now that you've learned to reflect on your life, now that you've learned how I reflect on my life, that's great. It's really good. Reflecting is good, but that isn't going to help you actually make a plan and a goal to actually get where you want. So at this point, it's time to make the goal, the grand target, because I believe as men, we are just much better when we are actually pursuing a target, pursuing a goal, pursuing a vision. When we're going after our purpose, we're just better. So in this next section, I'm going to help you take all that reflection, all that information, everything that we just did. I'm going to help you compile that information and help you craft it into a goal that you can laser focus on, because that is just simply the best way to get results from monk mode. And at this point, I don't really have anything else to say. So let's start here. First off, never, ever use the smart method for setting goals. I personally think it is trash, garbage, terrible. I think it's horrible, guys. And that's mainly because in my experience, in my own life, it has been much more effective to set goals that are way bigger than you think you can achieve than by setting smart goals. Smart goals is setting a goal that, oh, it's just maybe a little bit out of your reach. It's just maybe something that is a little bit more realistic. But to be honest with y'all, to me, when I hear the word realistic, the real word I hear is average. So just to conclude, so we're on the same page, guys. I do think setting smart goals is dumb, but only because they make you set realistic goals. I do love the specific and measurable part of the goal. You got to have something that is specific and measurable. Second off, setting three, five, 10, 10, 15 year goals to me is just stupid. Honestly, it is too far out for you to create meaningful action in the short term. Don't get me wrong. Should you have an overarching vision for your life? Absolutely. That's probably something like your five to 10 year goal. But guys, I think setting anything other than a one year goal really is just ineffective. And so how I personally do it is I set a one year goal. Then I break that goal down into quarterly goals. And guess what? From there, I break it down into monthly goals and we go even further. I break those monthly goals down into two week goals. But we'll cover all that in a little bit of a later video. For now, we're just gonna talk about how I set goals. Now, this is one of the biggest mistakes and one of the biggest mistakes I see people make in something that I did for a long time. But now the way I go about approaching setting my own goals is the first thing is I do is I do not allow myself more than three goals no more but glass i'm good at a lot of stuff i want to do amazon fba i want to own a store i want to own a farm i want to become a butterfly bro shut up your mind hell everyone's mind if you look at today's society it's already overstimulated guys i'm telling you right now one of the rarest and most valuable traits that is hardly found in young men is focus the ability to be able to focus on one to a few things for a long time so the answer your question is no, you cannot have more than three goals. And that is why I do something called a goal tournament. And it's really simple. I list out and when I did this, I had 20 goals. I listed them out on a piece of paper. And then what I did from there is I looked at the first two and I crossed out one. I looked at the next four and then I crossed two out. That's what I did all the way to the point till I had three goals or less left. Very simple. From there. From the three that I chose that I wanted to focus on, I prioritize which one of those is most important. And guys, this is going to be a hint for you. Do not let anybody else's thought process affect how you look at your goals. This is your goal. This is not their goal. So don't judge yourself if you have a weird goal. If your goal is to bang 20 chicks this year in 2023, bro, hey, do, do I agree with it? Not really. But hey, bro, that's your goal. Don't write down a goal that you think somebody else wants for you just because you think they want. And for those of you that are thinking, well, I'll just split time evenly between all three goals. You're, you're, you're living in La La Land. You're living in Rainbow Land. You're living with ice cream and butterflies, bro. You're not living in real life. If you think that you're going to split time evenly between those goals, I'm, I'm telling you right now, it's probably not going to happen. That is why we are prioritizing which one is the most important. For instance, I got three goals right now. Hit 150% on my quota at Yelp so I can make some money. Hit 100k subscribers before the end of the year and get 10% body fat. But as one of the hardest working people I know and probably that y'all know, I'm telling you right now, it is very hard to do all three of those. 
And sometimes, some days, when I'm not my best, one of them falls off. And right now, it's the 10% one. To me, it is more important. It is more crucial for me to hit that number L and build this YouTube channel. So in the off case, I do have an off day. I already know which one of my goals is probably going to take a hit for it. That is why it's important for you to prioritize your goals. Now, a lot of you guys are going to hate what I do next, but you know what? I'm okay with that. It's a reiterated version of something I learned from Grant Cardone. But what I do after I have those three most important goals to me and I prioritize them, guess what I do next? I take those three goals, something specific, measurable, quantifiable, a number that you can measure, hopefully. But I take those three goals and I multiply it by five. <gasps> oh my God, Glasgow Danny, realistic. You're, you, what? Your, your goal is to get to 100,000 subscribers and you multiply it by five? That's crazy. That's 500,000. I know. I take those three goals and I multiply it by five. And here's why. Because bigger goals stretch you. Wait. Pause. Okay, let's let's try that again. Bigger goals push you. They push you to become more creative. They push you to become more urgent. They push you to take more action. They push you to find more resources. They push you out of your comfort zone. And when you go out of your comfort zone, what happens? You grow. So that is why I set bigger goals than I think I can achieve. And guess what? If I don't hit that big goal that I thought or that I put down that I multiplied by five, I will probably end up a little short of it, but I'll end up at my original realistic goal. That's why I'm against smart goals. If you set a smart goal or realistic goal and you don't achieve it, you are still very far away from where you want to go. At least if you overset it and you missed the target, you are probably back at your original target. By setting goals higher than you think you can achieve, they help you grow and they help you go a lot further, a lot faster. And then finally, the last step that I take when it comes to approaching setting goals for myself is I detach completely from the goal. Now, wait, I know this nigga did not just spend a whole five to 10 minutes on this video talking about how to set goals. And now you're telling me to detach and not care about my goal. Yes, that's that's exactly what I'm telling you. Detach, let it go. Want to know something crazy about me? It's a weakness and it's a strength as a sales rep. If any of you guys have worked in sales, you know that we are measured on performance. We are measured on our performance towards a certain number that they give us. They may say, hey, this quarter, you need to sell $100,000 worth of new revenue in products. And so we're measured on that. But one of my biggest weaknesses as a sales rep, you won't believe this. I don't look at the numbers. I don't look at the numbers. I don't in the middle of the quarter, I don't know how much revenue I've sold. And that's probably really dumb, really stupid. But I'll explain why I think I do that. My boys, the reason I do that, the reason I don't look at the number, the reason I detach from the goal is because the God's honest truth is the goal. The outcome of getting the goal is in some ways uncontrollable. I can't exactly control if I hit the goal. However, what I can control is my actions towards the goal. I know that in sales, if I do enough calls, if I send enough emails, if I do enough demos, I know that by the end of the quarter, if I've done that, if I control what I can control, the likelihood and the chances of me hitting the goal are going to skyrocket. And so that is why I am consistently outperforming my targets and I am one of the top sales reps pretty much everywhere I go. And I don't look at the numbers. I don't look at the goal. I look at the actions to get to the goal. And that is what I control. And that is what I focus on. Guys, hear me when I say this. Don't focus on the goal. Focus on the process because the process is what we're going to be focused on in this next section of the video. I'm going to tell you guys how I reverse engineer my goals and map out a plan to achieve them most of the time. Trust me, you do not want to skip this part. So with that being said, the first thing I do is I set a vision for myself, an overarching goal, the theme for my life. And guys, trust me, your future self will thank you for this. And so, guys, if you're going to follow my process, you need to think about your life. What is it going to look like in the next 5, 10, 15 years? What kind of legacy? 
legacy are you going to leave behind? What kind of person do you want to be remembered by? These are all the things that you need to think about to help you determine your long-term vision. But guys, I get it. I know it's hard to set a long-term vision for your life, especially when some of you guys in hell, even me at some points, we're just struggling to get past today. We're struggling to get past Monday. So if you are struggling with determining a vision, an overarching theme for your life, something that can help, and I mentioned it in previous videos, is setting an anti-vision. My boys, by creating an anti-vision, you're going to have a crystal clear picture on what not to do in your life, and therefore it's going to help you construct your long-term goal or your vision. And when you get that, this will be the overarching theme for how we define our goals going forward. Now, guys, once you've determined your long-term vision, it's time to get down to the nitty gritty. It's time to define our goals. And I get it, guys. When you get to these goals, you're going to have all this excitement because you're going to be looking like, man, I want to accomplish this. I want to accomplish that. I want to accomplish everything. You just want to do everything. And guys, let me tell you from firsthand experience, quality over quantity, especially when it comes to goal setting. The idea of less is more is something that you should take note of here, guys. Rather than creating this long list of goals and then spreading yourself too thin to try to achieve all those goals and not making progress towards any of them, why not just determine which one of your goals is most important for you? Which one of your goals is really going to make the biggest impact on your life and then focus all your energy and resources on that? But even knowing that, I know choosing your goals is still going to be tough. So what I personally do is something called a goal tournament. And it's pretty simple, guys. All I do is I get out a sheet of paper and I list out all the goals that I have for my life or that for the immediate future. I list all those goals out. When I did this last time, guys, I had 20 goals that I wanted to accomplish. That's a lot. But that's where the goal tournament comes in handy. And my process is really simple, guys. All I do is once I get all those goals on a sheet of paper, I have them all in a list. I just face them off against each other. One versus two, three versus four, five versus six. And I mark off which one is least important based on the, the criteria that I'm looking at, guys. And so this way I do this goal tournament, it allows me to really prioritize the goals that are most important to me. So for you guys, once you go through your list the first time and you cross a few out, go through it again. And then go through it again until you have one to four goals that you want to focus on and no more than that. One to four. That's it. The next thing I do at this point is I define my yearly goal. And the way I do that is I look at the overarching theme, the vision. Remember, we did this earlier. I look at my vision and then I ask myself, what could I accomplish this year that would help me create meaningful impact towards that goal or meaningful progress towards that goal? Once I have my yearly goal from there, what I do is break that yearly goal up into quarterly goals. And now, guys, if you're going to do this, feel free to do all four quarters at once. But I typically just do one quarter, the quarter that I'm in, because I find that as I'm going through these goals, a lot of shit changes. From there, if you want extra credit, you can break your quarterly goals up into monthly goals. But I'll be honest, I don't always do this. It just depends on the situation. And the way you can get your monthly goals is by asking yourself the same type of question. What could I accomplish this month that's going to make meaningful progress towards my quarterly goal? It's pretty simple. Now, here comes the fun part. You break your quarterly goals up into two-week goals, or as I like to call them, two-week targets. Now, guys, your two-week target should be something that is tangible, something that is specific, and something that is going to make immediate impact in your progress towards your goals. Now, unlike your yearly goal, where I tell you guys you should go bigger when you're looking at your yearly goal, for your two-week targets, guys, you need to do something that is realistic. Why? Because your two-week target is something that we want you to hit. The reason being is when you hit these two-week goals, when you see yourself accomplishing that, when you see yourself marking that off the to-do list, guys, you gain confidence. You build confidence. You gain momentum, and it builds excitement, and that helps you further progress towards your long-term goal. So here's an example. If one of my yearly goals is get 200K subscribers on YouTube, one of my quarterly goals might be gain 25K followers this quarter. So then I would break that down even further and say my two week target is I will get 1000 subscribers in the next two weeks. That's how I would approach. Now I know what you're thinking, like Glass, how am I supposed to do that? Like if I knew how to get to my goal, then what do I even need this video for? And don't worry, bro, hold your horses, I got you. So in this next stage of my process, what I do is I brainstorm and I define the strategies that I'm going to use to reach my two week targets. Let me say that again, I brainstorm, and then I define the strategies which I'm going to use to reach my two week targets. Look, choosing the right strategies is not an exact science. And on top of that, just because you choose a strategy does not guarantee it to work. But that's the whole point of doing these two week targets, because what it does is it allows us to try a strategy for two weeks, analyze the results and see if this strategy is going to help take us to where we want to go. If not, then you can either do more of the strategy or you can completely replace it altogether. So with that being said, how do I 
I find these strategies? Well, for me personally, I take one or two days to research. Yes, guys, crazy to think, but I take a little bit of time to think and actually analyze what might be possible. So let's say for the example of, for me, one of my goals is YouTube, but one of the strategies I chose is posting more YouTube shorts. And that's because I watch a channel called Think Media and they told me that shorts is one of the upcoming trends for video this year. So what I did was I go look for people that are already doing what I want to do in my space. And I listen to what they have to say. I listen to the strategies that they're using. And I write all those strategies down on a list and then later we'll go through. Them. So after I've compiled my list of strategies from the people I've been watching or from gurus or whatever, it's time to do something that you guys should already be familiar with at this point. It's time to do not a goal tournament, but a strategy tournament. So it's the same thing that we just talked about. List all your strategies on one page, face them off against each other. One verse two, three verse four and go through them and cross one out every time you get there and repeat till you only get down to one to four strategies. Me personally, I only do one to three strategies per goal. That's it. I try those out for my two week target. After you've chosen your strategies, guys, the next step is to prioritize your goals. Look, I get it. it you're gonna have the inclination to think, okay, I can just split all my goals up evenly. I can do it evenly. But to be real with you as a person who's done it, as a person who's gone after the goals for a long time, you will always find that one of your goals takes priority over the other. When you have a, a small chunk of time, a little window of time to do something, you'll find out that you just naturally go towards the goal that you think is most important, whether that's subconscious or consciously. So what I'm saying is go ahead and prioritize it. After that, you need to analyze your time and determine how much free time do you actually think that you can devote towards all your goals per week. Meaning, not your job, you probably work your job eight hours a day. You probably gotta eat, you probably gotta go to the gym. But from there, what does your free time look like? Do you wanna spend half your free time doing social stuff and hanging out with friends? That's cool, that's fine, mark that out but you need to look at the free time that you actually do have and tally that up. How many hours do you have per week is what we're trying to come up with here. Then from there, based on how you prioritize your goals, you should break that out into percentages, meaning, all right, for goal one, for YouTube, I'm gonna spend 50% of my free time doing that. For goal two, I'm gonna spend 25% of my free time doing that. For goal three, I'm gonna spend 15% or whatever. I'm just making up numbers here, but you wanna break it out by percentage. And then what you wanna do after that is break it out into actual numbers. For example, for my goal of reaching 1,000 subscribers in the next two weeks, I will determine that for four hours a week, I will work on YouTube. For my goal of getting to 10% body fat, I will dedicate four hours to that, or whatever the case may be. You do it for your own specific instance, but you guys get what I'm saying. Actually break this out into numbers. We will use this later, and it's important. Now it's time to define what I like to call your key performance indicators, or in other words, your KPIs. Your KPIs are the strategies that you're going to use to reach your two week target. This is what separates the winners from the, well, non-winners. Basically what we'll be doing is we'll be turning our strategies into solid numbers that can be measured. Let's go back to my YouTube in shorts example, where I said I was going to post YouTube shorts over the next couple weeks so that I could hit my two week target of a thousand subscribers. So here's what I would do. Instead of saying, I'm gonna post whatever, shorts, this week, I'm gonna say, no, I'm gonna post seven shorts over the next two weeks. What I did there is I turned my strategy into an actual number that can be measured. The reason for that is it's very hard to analyze and improve something that you can't measure. It's very hard. So that's the reason we gotta put some numbers behind these strategies. And I just wanna make sure I'm repeating this, guys. For these numbers, please be realistic. I've made the mistake of saying I'm gonna do 38 shorts in two weeks, and even someone that is productive as me couldn't do it. So with the purpose of this, with the purpose of building momentum in mind, with the purpose of if this strategy does work, we will slowly increase it in our next two week sprint. With that in mind, please pick something realistic for the numbers behind your strategy. Also, once you've defined your numbers for your first strategy, make sure to do it for the rest. And just as a reminder, at this point, you should have about two to three goals and you should have about two to three strategies for each goal. And then from there, you should have one KPI or key performance indicator for each strategy. I know that's a little bit confusing, but guys, if you take the time to understand it, I promise you, it's gonna be worth And also just from an achievement standpoint and an accountability standpoint, it really helps to write out your KPIs like this. Meaning I will do X amount of shorts in the next two weeks. If there's just something that happens when you put pen to paper, 
It's basically you committing subconsciously. I'm going to do this in the next two weeks. All right. All right. I know this has been a lot and I know it's probably been a little bit confusing and probably a, a little more complex than it needs to be. But I promise you, Kings, we're almost there. We are almost to the point where you can take some action. There's just one more thing to do first. This next phase is where we plan our process, our tasks and our to do list. These are going to be the things that you have to do to reach the key performance indicators that you just said. It might be easier if you think about your future tasks like this. Who's going to be doing it? That's you. What are you going to be doing? When are you going to be doing it? And if necessary, where are you going to be doing it? For example, for me, as far as YouTube shorts go, I say, okay, every Thursday at 6 p.m., I'm going to work on YouTube shorts for one and a half hours. That's what I mean by actually putting a stamp on. And now see, we're coming full circle with this. This is why I had you guys prioritize your goals earlier and figure out how much time that you can actually invest in trying to reach these goals. Because I would strongly recommend that you guys also put your task actually on a calendar. You gotta put them on a calendar, why? Why would I do that? Well, from a time management standpoint, it gives you a visual representation of your day, but it also prevents you from overbooking yourself. From a goal standpoint, it forces you to prioritize what's important. All of us only get 24 hours in a day. So if you get to your schedule and you see that it's already full or you see that there's only one slot left, which one of your goals is going to go there? Guys, getting it on a calendar is really going to help. Also, putting it on a calendar drastically increases accountability. Guys, I already told you, but there's something that happens when you write down, hey, I'm going to do this over the next two weeks. But then something further even happens when you write that down and then you go and put that time slot on your calendar, the calendar that you look at every day. And every week you get there, you'll see, OK, this is for that time slot. And something happens when you commit, write those things down, put it on your calendar. It just gives you a much better chance of actually following through in doing whatever it is you said you was gonna do. So if we Gucci on that, y'all go ahead and block out time on your calendar for your goals based on the percentages you came up with earlier. And if you're anything like me, cause I'm really bad at math, I would use percentagecalculator.net. I'll leave the link in the description. Don't worry, it's free. And then guys, the last step I do is I look at my key performance indicators that I came up with and I break them down into the littlest, the most tiny baby steps. And guys, it helps to when you look at that indicator, and say, hey, what are some baby steps that I could do to actually reach this indicator? For example, with my KPI of posting seven shorts in two weeks, well, yeah, that's a great goal to have, but there's a process to get there. For example, I probably will need to look up a few videos on how to create YouTube shorts. I probably will then need to brainstorm some ideas of what I want my shorts to be about. I'll probably go back to some more videos to see, okay, how do I write my script? I'll then create an outline for the script. I'll then do the research for the script. Guys, you get my point. There's a process to you getting to that KPI. So that is where your task and your to-do list come up come from. And remember guys, think what steps do I need to do to make this happen? And keep in mind, baby steps. Now at the end of this process, I will normally have 10 to 15 to do items for each of my KPIs. And I will do these to do items in the calendar block that I set up for myself, depending on the goal. See, I'm tying it all together for y'all. Just don't, don't worry, bro. I got you. But there's more to this process because to be honest with you guys, making all these grand plans, mapping out your strategy to achieve the goals is good. But I'll be honest with you, it ain't going to work if you ask, can't execute. So that's why in this next section of the video, I'm gonna be covering some of the most important pillars of execution, which is installing good habits. So y'all already know what I'm about to say. This ain't Xbox, this ain't PS5. We ain't playing no games, so we gonna get right into it. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Let's start by understanding how habits are formed at a high level. Guys, when it comes to habits, I like to think of habits like little invisible strings that move us through life. They can propel us to success or they can hold you back. Good habits can fuel your success or bad habits can weigh you down. The good news is if you master your habits, guys, I believe you have the power to master your direction in life. But with that being said, let's take it a step further and get scientific on these boys. Now, when it comes to how habits are formed in the brain, I think it really helps to visualize like your brain being the computer and the software running on the computer is your habits. Because guys, the more you use habits, the stronger they become. Just like you can upgrade the software on your computer, you can upgrade your brain software by changing your habits. And by pinpointing the triggers that set your habits off, 
you can then switch those habits out with better ones. It's kind of like hacking your own brain, bros. Seriously, the sky's the limit here. Now, there's a lot of benefits to developing positive habits, but I just like to think of it like this. Habits are the soil in which the seeds of success, the seeds of wealth, the seeds of growth, they all grow. If you nurture them daily, bro, watch your life become abundant. It's pretty simple. But just like everything in life, there's good and there's bad. And there definitely are some challenges to building positive habits in your life. So first off, just so you know, creating new habits is helpful. But by no means is the shit easy. It's hard and it's going to take some work. and It's going to take some discipline because sticking to new habits can be a real challenge. But don't let failure discourage you in these situations and don't let procrastination and distraction sabotage your efforts, bros. Those are the two biggest enemies of habit formation. Think of distractions and procrastinations like a battle and you are the commander. The only way you can win the battle is by being intentional with your time and prioritizing your tasks. But guys, you got to trust me at this point. I'm not just going to send you into a battle with the sword so i'm gonna arm you with everything i know about how to build positive habits see see what i did there <laughs> yeah i know oh brother this guy stinks okay guys all these tips that i have pretty much come from a book called atomic habits and i'm gonna just keep it 100 bros that that is the realest book on habits i have ever read he literally covers everything so i'm not gonna be saying anything that is profound here but with that being said the first step to building positive habits guys is starting small by starting small and putting things into manageable tasks for yourself you allow yourself to build confidence and momentum and before you know it bros you've established a routine your small and tiny habit is just something you do automatically now the next thing you need to do is you need to stay consistent with your habits and i don't know how many times i have to say this but i believe discipline and consistency are two of the most important traits for men and without them they are doomed so i don't know if y'all know this but i had two shots to get back in the league after i was cut by the cowboys so back when i was at home prepping for any potential trials that would come up i was working out with this guy named fozzy whitaker he play at UT, play running back at UT around the same time that I did. And every day we worked out together and we worked out hard, but also every day he would do just a few things extra that I wouldn't do. For instance, we would work on the running back route tree. He would always stay after to continue to work on that and continue to work on one route in particular. He would also stay after to ice tub and stretch and just do all the little things that I refused to do. And little did I know that, that my lack of consistency was going to come back to haunt me in a big ass way. A week before we both got the call from the Carolina the Panthers. They told us both that they bring us in for a tryout winner takes all. But a week before that, I hurt my back and so I was compromised. Now, luckily, I miraculously recovered enough to even do the tryout, but I was at about 70%. So when we get to the tryout, guys, they have us do a, a, a full workout. They have us really go through everything. And I think I'm competing pretty much at the same level as Fozzie. I think it's neck and neck at this point. Then they had us go through the running back route tree. And every route that we both did was on point until we got to the last route. The one route that I would always skip when we when we worked out and Fozzie would work on it. Anyway, he runs the flat route, catches it just like I've seen him do a thousand times before. I run the flat route. I was confident in my abilities. That ball hit my hand and bounced off in the sloppiest way possible. I almost fell. I almost fell. And I already knew right then and there the tryout was over. And so y'all know what came next. Fozzie went on to play for the Panthers for the next four to five years. And I'm out here working at Yelp, slanging clicks. Now, I told you guys that story because staying consistent with your habits, staying consistent with your disciplines can be the little thing that separates you from achieving your lifetime dream or failing like I did. Trust me. I know. Now, the next step is building positive reinforcement for your habits. Guys, the more you do your habits, the stronger the connections in your brains become. And then throw on positive reinforcement on top of that. What it's going to do is make your brain crave that reward, making habits easier to stick. I personally allow myself a fun activity every time I complete my habits for seven days in a row. My body, my brain has started to crave that reward. So it is more motivated to do my habits all week. Another thing you could do is make your habit a non-negotiable part of your daily routine. And what I mean by non-negotiable is it don't matter if it's raining. It don't matter if it's snowing. It don't matter if your house burnt down yesterday. You are going to get out and do those habits no matter what. By making that habit a non-negotiable, you're going to make sure that habit becomes a part of your daily routine. Now, it's time to throw some tech in the mix. That's that's my favorite part. So, guys, if you really, really want your habits to stick, I recommend using a habit tracker, guys. Now, there's a thousand different apps out there, but the app I use is called Habitify. And, man, I don't know. There's just something so rewarding about opening up your phone, going to that app, and then checking off 
off that habit for the day. Just that little sound, the little buzz, whatever it does, there's something so rewarding about that. Y'all laughing now, but once you try, you'll, you'll believe me. And then the last step to making habits stick is setting up your environment to support those habits, guys. Trust me, your environment can either be your greatest friend or your biggest ally. Seriously, good luck trying to break the habit of going to the hub every night if you keep the lotion by your bed. Boy, you ain't breaking no damn habit. Do yourself a favor and change your environment to one that supports you and doesn't hurt you. Now, I know what you're thinking. Glass, how do I choose the right habit? And bros, I got you. You know I got you. The next step to building and choosing the right habits is by evaluating your current habits and actions, evaluating your goals and your value. Look, guys, habits are like the fuel that you put in your car. If you get a luxury car, if you buy a damn Ferrari, bro, you don't want to put 87 gas in your Ferrari. So why would you settle for habits that don't elevate your life? What you need to do is take a moment to think about what is truly important to you and what you want to achieve in life. Once you've done that, then you need to add the habits that can best support you and best help you get to those things. For instance, if you're looking to calm your mind, bro, try some damn yoga. By choosing habits that reflects what most matters to you guys, you're gonna give yourself the best chance to stick with that habit in the long term. And then the next step is to act like a scientist. Yes, a scientist. This means regularly testing, reflecting, and assessing your progress towards your goals and your habits. By doing this, you're gonna get a better understanding of what's working and what's not. You're gonna be able to make informed decisions about which habits are actually helping you and which habits you may need to refine. Guys, remember, habit formation is not a one-time event. This is a reoccurring process. So stay curious, stay testing, and find the best one for you. And now, as promised, my favorite habits. Guys, look, after years and years of testing, big habits, small habits, stupid ones, ridiculous ones. These are the habits that I find most effective. Not all of these will apply to you, bro, but if they do, then just take it. If you don't want it, then just leave it where it is. The first habit that I think is my favorite is visualization. The, in, the benefits to visualization are endless, bro. I find it not only helps me envision my future, which could activate the law of attraction, but it also focuses me on what I need to get done in my day-to-day -day life. The second thing is doing a power walk. It's something that Tony Robbins came up with, but this is where I use the opportunity to habit stack. I do my facial exercises, I get my motivation playlist going. I look at my goals. I visualize my goals. And then I listen to some more motivation on the way back. But the power walk also gets you some exercise. It gets your body moving and it gets you some vitamin D. Yes, the sun. The sun helps us with energy. So it gets you all those things and you can do all these habits on just one walk. So that's why I love it. And then the last one is called power five, but I changed it to power three. And it's just simply where I choose the three most important task or habits that I can do that day that will progress me towards my goals. And then I take those three tasks and I physically put them in my calendar. This just helps me further prioritize and prevents me from overbooking. And now, guys, goddamn, I feel like I've talked so much this video, but now, I have given you guys pretty much everything I know about helping you form positive habits. You see this? This is a basketball. That is me passing you the basketball. <laughs> This is me catching the ball. Hold on, let me get rid of this. I'll be your tour guide from here on out. Look, this next section is all about you killing those nasty things we call distractions and eliminating procrastination for good. So in this video, I'm gonna help you guys understand why you procrastinate. I'm gonna help you identify your sources of distractions, and I'm gonna give you guys some actionable practical strategies on how to kill them both forever. So y'all go ahead and hand me that spatula. I need my utensils because glass about to cook. So let's start with identifying your source of distractions. And let's both of us just look each other in the eye and be real. You're probably on your phone right now. Well, look in your hand because that right there is your biggest source of distraction. Humor me for a second. Go into your settings right now. Go to the screen time. Go to the weekly setting. And then leave me a comment below. Let me know how many hours you spent on social media on your highest day. I want to see the I want to see the comments. So leave me a comment. Now I want you to take that number and multiply it by seven. And then I want you to multiply that number by 52. And then I want you to Divide that number by 24. I know I'm over here acting like a goddamn math professor, but bro, just entertain me for a second. Guys, the funny thing is anytime I take someone's phone and do that experiment with them, it never comes up less than they spend 30 to 50 days a year on social media. 30 to 50 days. Do you have any idea what you could accomplish in 30 to 50 days? That's a rhetorical question. Please don't answer it. You can accomplish a lot. Guys, just over the last 30 days, I've made 15 YouTube videos. And for me, you know, they're not performing that great or whatever, but for somebody else, those 15 videos might 
might blow them up. It might make YouTube a career for them. It might make them not have to work at the job they hate anymore. It might give them time, freedom, and flexibility. You get what I'm saying? You can do a lot in 30 to 50 days. In addition, I have something else to help you guys identify your sources of distraction. I want you to go through this week. This is a challenge to you. Go through this week. Keep a distraction log. Anytime you get distracted or anything that takes up too much of your time, I want you to just write it down. Don't get mad at yourself. Don't change anything yet. Let's just observe ourselves and see what it is that's actually distracting us. This will help us come up with a strategy to eliminate that. Now on to understanding procrastination and why we do it. Listen, let me tell you guys, procrastination is a big issue for a lot of folks out there and they just don't want to admit it. But let me tell you this, procrastination can ruin anything from your personal life to your damn career. But the worst part is a lot of us don't even know why we do it at all. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? We've all been there. You sit down to do a task. You have your mind set on this task and you're going to do it. And we sit down and before we know it, hours have passed and we still ain't got nothing done. We're still looking at our phone. We're still staring. And if that don't sound familiar, I know you're lying. Listen, procrastination is a sneaky beast that will hold most people from reaching their potential, but it's not completely their fault. It's not your fault. Procrastination is a complex behavior that's caused by a lot of stuff, whether that's field failure, lack of motivation, bad time management skills. But procrastination isn't a character flaw. It's a behavior with strong scientific backing on how our brain works. But by understanding the science of procrastination, we can take back control and turn procrastination from our enemy to our ally. Let me tell you right now, that shit ain't easy. But that's because distractions are everywhere and they're stealing your time, your productivity, your focus, your efficiency. But you ain't gotta be a victim, bro, because with the right tools, you can reclaim your focus. So what is the secret weapon, Glass? Well, here are my exact strategies for overcoming distractions. First, you gotta identify your biggest distractions. If you don't know what they are, good luck stopping them, bro. Secondly, you gotta turn off notifications on your phone. Turn all of them off, bro. There's nothing worse than sitting down at your desk, getting ready to really put in that work, and then your friend calls you complaining about the ex-girlfriend that they've been complaining about for the last six months and you're just wondering why won't they leave why won't you just go find someone else to date and now you're all distracted and you ain't got shit done <laughs> That was extreme. <laughs> Turn your notifications off because that shit can be discussed later. Third, you got to set limits for social media usage. And guys, I use apps and all kinds of stuff to do this, or I just completely eliminate social media altogether. Next, you got to create an environment that supports deep work. And guys, this is important. Our brain works off triggers. For example, if you had something traumatic happen to you while eating cake, the very next time or sometime long in the future, the next time you eat cake, you're going to relive that traumatic experience that you had because it's associated with the cake you ate. But you can use this to help. Guys, right now I have a standing desk. I have created a custom focus playlist on YouTube. And so guys, when I come to this desk, when I raise the desk up, when I turn that playlist on, my body, my mind is instantly triggered right there. It's triggered to get into a focused state, to get into a place where we can do deep work because I have been triggering my mind to do this all the time. I've been training my mind to do this, right? Because now every time I stand my desk up, turn that playlist on. It takes me back to the first moment I did that and achieved focus. That is how you can train your brain. That's how you can use triggers to help you create an environment that can support you getting away from your distractions and doing deep work. The next thing you need to do is time blocking. And this is great because you can set a specific time during the day for when you can handle all your degenerate stuff. Whatever y'all doing out there, y'all can handle it during that time. And then you set other times to handle your main task. Guys, don't just let anyone call you at any time or text people back at any time. Do those in designated sections of your day. Lastly, ask yourself what activities you can do today that will make the biggest impact towards your goals. Guys, and this one is important because, man, just because you're busy does not mean you're productive. Guys, I know so many girls that clean their house for two to three hours a day. I'm not talking for the week, nigga. I'm talking every single day. And while a good clean house is great, while it does kind of help, you know, you know, being organized does make you feel good. Is that really getting you towards your goals? If your goal is to become a social media influencer, is you cleaning your house for five hours a day? Does that help you? No. Are you busy? Yes. But did you make any progress? Hell no, you didn't. Sorry, guys. I got really frustrated with that because I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm not the cleanest nigga in the world, but damn, maybe I should clean 30 minutes a day, but I ain't spending three hours a day clean. I got too much shit to do. You feel me? So by asking yourself this question, guys, you're going to be able to do the activities that actually get you towards your goals. Now, speaking of goals. Here's how I killed that nasty cockroach called procrastination once and for all. The first thing I did and that you need to do is realize when you're procrastinating. Again, I'm sorry to repeat this. Awareness of something gives you the ability to actually change it. You need to know when you're procrastinating. That's the first step. Next, you got to find out why you're procrastinating. And I mean, get to the root cause. What is holding you back from taking action? Is it fear of failure? Is it lack of motivation? Does the project, does it overwhelm you? Does it seem too intimidating? Whatever it is, you need to find it and identify it quick. 
the next thing you can do is break your projects up into small manageable tasks. And I cannot stress how important this is. The way our brain works is it is designed to keep us away from fear. It is designed to run away from that. So what you do when you give yourself this big project to do just kind of one big project, your brain gets intimidated. That seems dangerous to it. It's like, damn, how the hell am I going to get all the way to step Z, you know, the end of this project when I ain't even started? For your brain, it's kind of like it pulled up to Mount Everest thinking it was going to climb it, looking up to the top of the mountain thinking, damn, how the hell am I going to ever get there? The truth is winners don't do this. Winners don't look at the top of the mountain thinking, how am I going to get there? They don't focus on the top of the mountain. Guess what they focus on? They focus on the next step. They focus on one step at a time. And then by repeatedly doing that, they reach the top of the mountain. So that's what you need to do by breaking your projects up into small, manageable tasks. All you're doing is completing one step at a time. And when you're doing that, you're building confidence and you're building momentum to actually get to the end of the project. You see, you see what I'm saying? Confidence and momentum does wonders for anybody trying to achieve their goal. And I know I already covered this because I just went on a rant about it. I was supposed to save it for now. But the next thing you need to do is change your mindset and build momentum. Guys, with each step you take up that mountain, you're going to build momentum and confidence, guys. So you need to change your mindset. If you don't achieve the goal immediately, guys, don't be disappointed. Don't hate yourself. You need to start thinking of it as progress, progress over perfection. Every little step you take, that's something you should be congratulated on, something that you should be proud of yourself for momentum and doing all that guys helps you with achieving goals. Lastly, you got to reward yourself, not for completing the goal, because the truth is we don't know when that's going to happen, but you need to reward yourself for each step you take, because that is setting up a reward system. Your brain craves that. It craves that dopamine. It craves that reward. So by doing that, you are now tricking your brain into doing the work that you want it to do because it knows it's going to get a reward. So don't just focus on the big goal. Focus and congratulate yourself with each step. Now, Guys, you finally have all the tools, all the knowledge, all the information you need in regards to killing procrastination and distractions for good. Now, all that's left for you is to learn how to master your day and perform at a high level consistently. And guys, let me tell you, I am so excited to share my process because a lot of my real life friends always ask me like glass, how do you continue to be a top performing sales rep? You're constantly improving your physique. You run a YouTube channel where you do everything, editing, filming, all of it, and you still kind of make time to be social. And I'm gonna be real with you. That's kind of hard. I ain't even gonna cut. I believe the secret sauce to people making big progress towards their goal all lies in their daily routine. And if people just take the time to understand the pillars of a productive daily routine, then it has the power to completely transform their lives. And if they don't, they will probably come to the end of 2023, just like they did last year, look at their goals and be like, God damn. I didn't come close to hitting any of these. So that's why in this video, I'm gonna share with you guys my daily routine on how I maximize productivity, guys. But you need to understand, this is not a one size fits all solution. Just because this works for me doesn't mean it'll work for you, but I hope that you take a few things and use it in your process and you get better at executing on a day-to-day -day basis. So with all that out of the way, y'all know I ain't Xbox. This ain't Skyrim. We ain't playing no games. We're gonna get right into it. Let's go! Now, because of football, guys, I've always kind of been a morning person, but I understand being a morning person is not for everybody and creating a very good morning routine is very hard to do. But creating a morning routine is vital, guys, because a morning routine is at the start of your day. And for the average person, if your day starts like shit, then the rest of your day will be shit. And we don't want that. So here's my morning routine that has me feeling like muff Goku by 8 a.m. So here's my routine that has me feeling like Goku by 8 a.m. See, guys, after football, I used to hit the snooze on my alarm like it was my job. But I realized that the root of the problem had to do with my environment. See, guys, I set my alarm for 67 degrees because that's how I, that's really the only way I can go to sleep. And that's great for when you're trying to go to sleep. But it's a whole lot different story when you wake up at 4 a.m. and you feel that 67 degree AC touch your body. The first thing you're going to do is be like me and want to go back to sleep for 30 more minutes. And then I do that. And next thing I know, three and a half hours have passed. But after assessing and analyzing, guys, I figured out I can't let that happen anymore. If I'm going to be if I'm going to go where I need to go, I need to get my ass up. So here's how I have changed that. See, guys, it was a simple fix after I did a little bit of reflection and analyzing. All I did was change. I, I keep the temperature at 67 degrees when I sleep, but now I have it slowly rise to 76 degrees by 4 a.m. Why do I do that? I don't know about y'all, but I can't sleep when I'm hot. That shit is uncomfortable, bro. That shit not fun. Ain't nobody getting no sleep in 76 degrees. Can't do it. So what happens, guys, instead of me, by the time 4 a.m. comes around, the AC is already at 76 degrees. So by this time, I've already probably been feeling a little comfortable. Then I hear my alarm at 4 a.m. And I'm like, 
I could go back to sleep, but it don't really feel good in here. Feel kind of hot. I don't want to go to sleep in this. So what it does is it forces my body to get up. So that fixed one half of my problem. So next I had a bad habit of reaching for my phone as soon as I got up, you know, just mindlessly scrolling on social media. And I'll be honest, I didn't completely fix this habit. I still reach for my phone. But now instead of going on social media and scrolling, I go straight to my custom created playlist on YouTube of motivational speakers. And guys, trust me when I say it is very hard to sleep for an extra 15 minutes when you got David Goggins yelling at you. Why don't you go ahead and just stop? Call your girl, have her pick you up. And that's when I feel like a little bitch, a little bitch. Next, I knock out my daily self-care routine, guys. I do the normal stuff. I brush my teeth, take a shower, sometimes hot, sometimes cold. Guys, I take all my medicines that I have to for life. You know, some, you know, nigga gotta take medicine. I'm getting old up here, okay? Then I hit my protein shake and I pop a caffeine pill. Yes, I am into biohacking. Don't judge me, bro. I'm just trying to be productive out here. From there, I focus on getting my body moving by taking my dog Yoshi on a walk, guys. And this is where the real game changer comes in. I use that walk as a chance to habit stack. Habit stacking is where you you take an old habit and you add new habits to it making it easier for your new ones to stick so since i'm already walking yoshi for like two hours a day i figure why not add some stuff to that walk so here's what i do the first thing i do is facial exercises i learned it from first man and men's maxing guys and i do this to try to to try to boost my levels of looks call me shallow call me what you want but i want to be attractive to the opposite sex i'm sorry does that make me wrong? I want to be attractive to them. So I do some facial exercises. Second thing I do is review my goals. Guys, it's important that you stay focused on the task at hand. And this helps with that. Third thing I do is visualize my future and the steps it's going to take to get there, guys. Now, before you judge, I just want you to know most pro athletes do visualization. You know them games that y'all be watching? But guess what? Those guys have already played that game in their head probably 10 times before they ever step on that field. So don't tell me visualization don't work. Some of the top athletes do it. And to wrap it up, I blast my Vegeta motivational playlist on the way home as I'm walking back. Man, that guy, I just love his hard work and he gets me hype as hell. So at this point, I'm back in my crib and I'm hype as shit, right? Right. But you can't just be hype. You got to focus that energy. So then what I like to do is the power five, but really I have changed it to the power three. So I go to my desk. I look at my goals again and I ask myself what are one to three things I could do today that is going to make the biggest impact or biggest progress toward my goal. Because guys, you got to understand being busy does not mean you're being productive. Productive. And by me doing the power three, what that allows me to do is prioritize what I'm going to do for the day. But just identifying your power three isn't going to be enough. I recommend that you take the next step and actually physically carve out time on your calendar to do these actions. Trust me. By putting it on your calendar, you're mentally committing to the time and you're being very realistic about the 24 hours you have to do whatever it is you want to do. By doing this, guys, it's going to help you out in the long run. By the way, I recommend setting aside one to two hours per power task. And then from there, it's simple, guys. I go smash on some breakfast. And then lastly, at this point in my morning, I got about an hour and a half before work. And what you'll find out about me is, guys, I don't like to do a lot of things at once. I think the brain works better when you don't multitask. So what I'll do is I will, lead, I will use this hour and a half as a lead blocker, I will do all my admin tasks, all the little BS that gets in my way during the day. I'll handle that here in the morning. That way, when it comes to my daily routine and doing the stuff that matters, nothing gets in the way I can attack with full tenacity. All right, now on to the bulk of my day and how I manage it. And heads up, this is where most people drop the damn ball. You guys got to understand, it's not about creating more time. That's not even possible. There's only 24 hours in a day for all of us. But how you use that 24 hours is what makes the difference. And the biggest thing that can help you use that 24 hours correctly in terms of going towards your goals is learning to say no. Learning to tell people no. By doing this, you're going to be able to further zero in on what's important to you. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is using this powerful combination of time blocking and the Pomodoro technique. I call it my golden hour. During this golden hour, I turn off all distractions. I put my phone literally outside the room. I turn off all the notifications. I put my emails to sleep and I silence my chat at work because this is my time. This is my golden hours. And from there, I work in 25 minute bursts. After I do 25 minutes, I rest for five minutes and then I do 25 more minutes that completes my hour block of whatever I'm working on. Now, you may not think that's going to make a big impact, but let me tell you, my guy, you are wrong on that. Because like I said earlier, guys, the brain does better when it's not multitasking, when it's focused on one thing. The problem is a lot of people, let's say sales, for example, they try to do emails, they try to do calls, they try to do admin, they try to do all that stuff at once instead of segmenting it out and doing one thing at a time. And because I have switched to this mode of operating where I do one thing at a time for that hour block. Trust me, I'm able to accomplish more in that hour than most people do at Yelp in their whole work day. 
Okay, I'm able to do more in that hour than they do in eight hours because my work is focused and highly intentional. But don't think for a second that I just do all this all day without taking a break. Guys, look, I'm one of the most productive mother I know. And I can't even go eight hours straight while doing this. So I do take some breaks, specifically after my hour burst. I will take a 30 minute break and I'll go chill. Maybe go eat some lunch. Maybe go watch some anime. Maybe go watch some YouTube videos. You know, relax a little bit. Yeah, it's taken away from the time that we actually work, but it's gonna be making us more focused on our next blast. So the efficiency won't change there. So at work, what I'll do is I'll do my first hour on sales calls. And then my next hour will be just straight emails. And by doing that, guys, I'm able to, to send a lot of them and send very good emails. The brain just works better when it's not multitasking. So then I repeat those hour blasts all day till about 1 p.m. That's when I'm done working at Yelp. Now don't tell them. Well, actually, really, it shouldn't even matter because if I'm able to do more than most people and stop working by 1 p.m., then, then it really shouldn't matter to them. But from there, I take a lunch break and then it's all YouTube. And I use the same technique, time blocking the Pomodoro technique to work on my YouTube videos as well. And I do those things one at a time. Here's an extra tip though. Guys, why don't you go ahead and help yourself by setting up your environment, create a playlist to where you can actually focus. Make sure your desk is clean. Or uh, for me, I have a standing desk because that's when I do best. That's when I do my best work. That's when I focus when I'm standing. So I'll stand up, I put on my focus playlist and then we moving and grooving, baby. And then finally at 5.30, I take a break and I go do a group fitness class. Now I do Orange Theory, guys. I know you guys probably want to lift. You guys want to be meatheads and that's fine. Honestly, I, I would do that too. But here's the thing. I don't want to have to think. I want to use all my brain power for my two main goals, which is Yelp and, and YouTube. So I want to go somewhere where somebody tells me what to do. I can work hard and go home. So I, I do that and I work out. Then I go home, take my protein shake. Then it's back to YouTube till 830. Then it's time to walk the dog again. And guess what I do, guys? Yes, you got it correct. I have it stack. I use that time effectively. What I'll do is I'll look at some prompts as I'm walking. I'll use voice to text to jot down my notes for me reflecting. And then I'll take that time to either listen to a course or some audible books as well. After I get back home, I'll pop some melatonin. I'll pop some CBN, you know, just to get my mind in my body right for a good night's rest. From there, I whip up some good dinner. You know, I keep it pretty simple. A nigga don't really know how to cook like that, but I do some steak and eggs, brown rice, you know, typical shit like that. Broccoli, you know, uh, baked chicken, brown rice, you know, the typical stuff. Uh, I'm trying to get the 10% body fat, okay? But anyway, here's the real secret to my successful nighttime routine, evening routine, whatever you want to call it. The real secret is once I've done all that stuff, guys, I take some time to wind down. I just went hard from 4 a.m. till about 8.30 p.m. I just went hard. No use in trying to kill yourself. So I take some time, I take my dinner, I go sit on the couch, I go watch some anime. Right now I'm watching Hunter Hunter, that shit, that shit live as hell, I can't even cap. That shit really good. But I do believe in working hard, but I also believe in taking breaks. I'm a guy that I can't shove any more educational content on me right before I go to bed because my brain will never shut off. It'll just keep thinking about it. So this is how I, wind myself down for sleep. So after I get done watching TV, I go into my room to create the perfect environment. I turn my fans on. I have another fan right next to my bed. Turn that one on. That way it's cold as hell in my room. I go close my blinds, close my shades, my blackout curtain. That way it's completely dark. And then I turn on some sleep hypnosis, some sleep affirmation. Now, I don't know if that stuff works, but I figure it can't help. Uh, and I think it works, by the way. And then it is time to set my alarms and I am out. I am asleep by 10, 1030 max and getting ready for the next day. And just like that, guys, it is a wrap. No burrito. That's really all I got to say. That was my daily routine for maximum productivity. That was the daily routine that allows me to outwork at least 90 percent of people in this world. So now that you understand to achieve your goals, it's going to take massive action. And now that you've learned to structure your day to do just that, I guess the only question that's probably left in your mind is like glass. What now? What do I do after this section? And in my opinion, that is a question that needs answers because look, guys, taking a bunch of action is useless. OK, let me walk that back a little bit. It's not completely useless, but it is highly ineffective without this. In my previous videos, I talk a lot about morning routines, daily routines, adding habits, being hyper productive. But I'm going to be honest with you guys without reflection and without introspection, you're leaving a lot of meat on the bone, bro. There is like a deeper flavor of meat happening here. So in this video, I'm going to be talking to you guys about why self-reflection is important, why it's very important for you to take time to self-reflect and analyze your actions. And I'm going to give you guys my personal approach on how I do all of this. So why don't you go ahead and hand me a spatula, go ahead and pass me the utensils because glass about to cook. So let's start with this. So why is self-reflection so important? And the reason I believe is because taking the same action over and over and over again and expecting the different results is the definition of insanity. Why? 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 
Why? Why? And the problem is when people go into monk mode, they go into this period of time where they take excessive action, but it's often ineffective. So that's where self-reflection comes in. Simon Sinek says reflection is the ability to be able to look at oneself critically and be able to look at those past actions and analyze to get better results in the future. Think about NFL players. Think about any professional athletes, guys. Practice in games is just not enough for them. Even after they get done doing all that practicing and doing all those games, guess what? They still go and watch film. And that's because they are looking at the chance, they're looking for the opportunities that they can be better on the field they're analyzing their actions and seeing where they can improve in the future so similarly guys if you want to be on monk mode and you're going to take excessive amounts of action it is also just as important to make sure you reflect on that action and then make adjustments so you can get the best possible results from monk mode now i get it you guys still may be a little hesitant with the whole idea of self-reflection because you know self-reflecting is probably not the most manly thing in the world so a lot of guys don't want to do it but there are a lot of benefits to self-reflect for one you'll gain a lot of self-awareness guys and i always say it on this channel guys if you don't know about it, then you can't change it. Also, you'll be able to make informed decisions based on data. For instance, if you've been eating Fruit Loops for the last 100 days and then you're shocked that your six pack hasn't come in, then maybe you could look back at the last 100 days and see like, okay, I didn't get my six pack. Maybe I need to get rid of this sugary ass cereal that I'm eating every morning. That might help. That's stupid. Use your common sense. Furthermore, you can optimize your process so you can look at things critically and be like, how can I do this faster and better? And then lastly, you can be a lot better at prioritizing your goals, guys, because by looking at your goals and then looking at the actions you took the entire week and then being able to see, OK, I said I want this goal, yet only 20 percent of the actions I'm taking is actually moving me towards this goal. By being able to analyze that, you're just going to make results a lot more faster than most people. Now, at this point, guys, you're probably wondering, like, Glass, when do I make time to reflect? And don't worry, bro, I got you. Look, making time to reflect it's just like any other action in your life you're going to have to make it a priority and you're going to have to put it into your daily schedule somehow so this may not be for you but this is how i do it guys there are three major reflection points in my life in my current schedule the way i do it right now i reflect daily i reflect weekly and i reflect after every sprint whether it's two or three weeks so every night i walk my dog and i reflect on a few prompts and i use voice to text to make sure i jot down those notes on sundays guys i go to a coffee shop to reflect on my weekly actions i ask myself stuff like okay how can i have been better this week what opportunities did I miss? You know, where could I optimize my process? I'm asking myself stuff like that. And I take time to write it down and brainstorm about it. And then so every two to three weeks, guys, at the end of my sprint, I take time to reflect. Guys, I ask myself questions like, OK, did I get to my goal first and foremost? OK, well, if I got to my goal, was that ineffective or was that effective towards getting me towards my long term six month or yearly goal? And by doing this, guys, you're thinking and acting like a pro athlete. Number one, you're taking massive action. Number two, you're reviewing your results. Number three, you're looking at ways to improve your results the next time you go out and by doing that guys you're going to make so much more progress than the guy who's over there trying to break down a brick wall with a pillow by doing the same thing over and over again that has not worked for the last year so why is he still doing you won't be that way. okay so for some context if you guys have not checked out my videos about how to set goals and then how to make a plan to actually achieve them you should definitely check those out but i'm going to give you a quick version right here so what i do guys is i make a quarterly goal and then i break that up into two to three week sprints so for instance let's say my quarterly goal is gain 23,000 subscribers this quarter, right? I will break that down into chunks by two weeks instead of say the first two weeks of this quarter, I want to gain a thousand subscribers. From there, I pick two strategies that is designed to get me closer to the goal. And what I do that's different here is from there, from that point on, what I do is start focusing on the strategies and not the goal. I start focusing on the action I'm taking instead of the goal. For example, my goal of getting to a thousand subscribers in the next two weeks, that's my goal. The strategies I'm going to use to get there is by posting well edited videos and by posting shorts. From there, I quantify those strategies. I say, OK, I am going to post three well edited videos in the next two weeks and I'm going to post 15 shorts in the next two weeks. You guys see what I'm saying here? I'm quantifying the actions I'm going to take. And then from there, it's simple, guys. You know what I do? I put my head down and I put in the damn work. And then at the end of the three week sprint, the first thing I do to reflect is I analyze the numbers. I ask myself, OK, did I hit my action targets? What results did they produce? Do I find that this strategy would be effective for helping me grow my YouTube channel? Because, guys, by taking the systematic approach, Approach, I can achieve my goals a lot more effectively than taking a shotgun approach. Another way that I approach self-reflection is from the standpoint of efficiency and optimization. So let's take the case. I say the well-edited videos did the best job in getting me a lot of subscribers. That's perfect. That's great. But now we have a problem. 
to make the well edited videos, it takes me a lot of time. But I've already proven to myself, okay, these well edited, edited videos get me great results on YouTube. So this is the point where my reflection comes in handy because now I have a strategy that I know works. Now I just need to do more of it. So what I'm doing here is asking myself questions like, okay, how can I do this better? And how can I do it faster? And for me, that was simple. I came up with my own self-made editing guide. I bought templates so I could do things a lot faster. I have my lights all set up. That way I don't have to set a lot of shit up when I'm starting to record videos. I just made my process a lot more efficient and I optimize it to help me best create more videos faster. The takeaway here for you guys is reflect daily, reflect weekly, and reflect at the end of every sprint, guys. Become the conscious observer of your own actions and I promise you will not regret it. But I'll be honest, just observing your actions and writing it down in your journal really isn't gonna do shit for you unless you take some action to change. And we're gonna talk about how to do that now. Okay guys, have you ever seen a football team just be like completely getting their ass kicked in the first half. Then they go out in the second half and they look like a completely different team and win the game. Well, that's because they're watching film and analyzing the results during the game so that it can make adjustments. That's how they came back in the second half and won the game. Well, guys, that's about to be you. After my two week sprint, I look at my numbers and I ask myself, did this produce the result I wanted? If so, why? If not, why not? And then I ask myself what the problem might be for that. Do I need more of this strategy? Do I need more volume? Do I need to increase the quality? Do I need to increase or change the topic all together? Do I need to use a different strategy that's not related with this at all? I'm asking myself a ton of these questions so that I can make a better plan going forward. And then if I come to the conclusion that I need to do more of it, then I ask myself, okay, well, how can I optimize and make this process more efficient? And on the other end of the coin, I look at my numbers and I say, okay, yes, I did hit my actions, but it did not produce the result I wanted. At that point, I'm going to start looking for different strategies to get me to my bigger long-term goal. And then from there, I do some research. I look at maybe some of the gurus or people who are already doing it in my space and I look in and look into the strategies that they have been posting or talking about. And then so I'll compile a list of all these strategies that are meant to help me get to the big goal. And then I'll do what's called a strategy tournament where I just face them off against each other until I've come up with two to three potential strategies that would help me get to the goal. And then once I have the strategies picked out, what I do is I set a quantifiable number for those strategies and then I restart the process from there. And then once I do have the two to three strategies picked out, I set a quantifiable number for those strategies and I just simply restart the process. So guys, that is my process of how I self-reflect. I guarantee if you just take some of this information and implement it into your own life, I, I bet it's going to help you out. It's going to help you out a ton. So now that I've given you guys all the secrets, all the information I have. Now, at this point, the only thing left for you to do is go take some action. And I mean, go put in that work. But before you do, guys, I want to make sure I'm helping out as much as possible. So down in the description below, I have provided a resource some worksheets to help you guys follow along. I hope it helps. But with that being said, back to our regularly scheduled programming, it looks like it's time for a glass guarantee. Guys, zoom in on me when I say this. Follow this plan and I personally guarantee you that in 90 days, you will look back and you will not recognize yourself in 2023.